This podcast is sponsored by and recorded at Crossings Pub and Eatery on Hyde Park. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you're joining us. We welcome you back to another edition of The Vickers Crossing, coming to you from Crossings Pub and Eatery on Hyde Park Road in London. And my name is Rob Henderson. I'm the uh, priest and rector of Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Memorial Anglican Church in London. My name is Kevin George, and I'm the fellow who comes here to record this podcast with Rob. I'm also a priest, and I hang out at uh, St. Aidan's Church in London, Ontario as well. All right, well, good to have everybody back after a couple of week break, and we're back in our virtual space where we always try to get faith to intersect with the public square, and we're looking forward to a good conversation today. Um, We're welcoming our MP of London North Centre here in London, and I'm going to mess it up, Peter. No, that's okay. Give Give it your best shot. Peter Fraga, no, I, I messed it up, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, you're close. You do it. <laughs> Peter Fragascados. Fragascados. That's perfect. Got it. Yeah, okay. That's perfect. Uh, Listen, I won't hold it against you. But yeah. I will yeah. I will freely admit to the fact that it uh, took me a year to get past Fragas Tacos. <laughs> yeah. Well, which is more Mexican however you than Fragas Tacos. I've, I've been called far worse. So <laughs> don't, uh, well, for the next 45 minutes, you're Peter. <laughs> and uh, our MP from London North Center, who's here to join us to, to chat a bit. Uh, about his journey and uh, his work as a public servant and other things, and we'll get to, to Peter in just a few minutes. So it's good to have you with us. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Welcome it's great to, great to be with you, and we've been talking about putting this together for a, a little while now, yes, and I'm glad yeah. it, uh, it's finally happened. Good, yep. good. All right. Well, Kevin, let's check in to see what's going on with you guys and uh, what you've been up to. I know yesterday the big talk was that there was a guy in – in investments running yep. around with ashes it was, yep. throughout London. It was to, in fact, one guy, I, I, yesterday was Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of Lent for us, of course. And so for me, I like to do ashes to go. Uh, come get your ash tag, as I like to say. And uh, so I was uh, out at um, the market, and I was at the public library, and I was at the Byron Library, and I was at uh, the Tim Hortons in Byron, uh, seeing people at all locations administering ashes. Um, which is a, a, a custom in our church as we prepare for Lent by placing ashes on our forehead made with the palm branches from last year's Palm Sunday celebrations. And uh, interesting conversations downtown always. And uh, the one guy um, uh, who came said, uh, I'm really interested, he said, in, in, uh, in what this is. We're <laughs> Where did you get those ashes? Are those someone's ashes? I said, no, <laughs> no, 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 they're not someone's ashes. These no. are ashes from the palm branches. So anyway, it was a good day, a good way to interact with people out in the community. You know, I, I, I you get to meet people out there that you won't see coming to the church. And I, I always re- recall the story actually from a year previous where a woman came and she saw me standing there. And I just simply stand with, uh, with a sign. I don't approach anybody. Uh, in fact, as the one guy said, I thought you were one of those crazies that stands on the corner down there. And I said, no, no, I'm just a crazy who stands down here in front of the library. <laughs> but um, this woman came up to me and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, are you really distributing ashes? And I said, yes. Mm. And she said, well, uh, I just left the house and I, with tears in my eyes telling my husband that it's the first Ash Wednesday in my memory uh, that I didn't have ashes on my forehead to start the day. And she said, and the reason I don't is because my daughter died and her funeral was at the church. And I haven't been able to go back since her Mm. funeral. Mm. And she said, and now I'm going to go home with my groceries and he's going to see that cross on my forehead. Mm. So pray for me. Please pray Mm. for me that this will be the beginning of me getting back to my community and back to church. Wow. That's really powerful stuff. Very much so. So it's good to get out and and do all that. So I was doing that, hanging out. You know, Lent has started now, so it's book studies and midweek services and all the stuff. I'm sure you've got it going on. Yeah, we're getting into it now. We're starting a book study uh, this week and uh, doing something something special with some of the younger members of our our parish and preparing them for... um, somewhat of a first communion it's called a life in the eucharist life program the eucharist, where we nice, bring yeah. in some of Good our younger of seven eight nine ten year olds and start talking about uh the meaning behind communion that they come up to and participate in every week but they get a chance to kind of share do some learning. their thoughts and learning about it and that's always fun to do too so yeah so yeah we're uh, underway with that and some other things as well you know what was really cool at our place this last weekend there was a guest preacher on sunday night for a new form of church we had that we call bridges banquet and it's a, it, it's a dinner church. So we actually began with the blessing of the bread and mm-hmm. passed the bread together. And then we shared a meal together. 
everybody takes part in making the meal. You come in, you sign up on a whiteboard for a job, so you could be cutting carrots, setting up tables, cleaning the dishes, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's designed for people who've, you know, been disenfranchised with church or never really got involved in church. And so it was really a neat way to bring people in. And there were about 30 of us there and, I, and about 12 that had never really been to our community before. Mm -hmm. So it was a good way to introduce them. And so instead of having a balding, middle-aged, overweight preach, preacher flapping his gums from the <laughs> front. That's not you. I don't know who I'm talking about, but uh, we, had, we invited a young man to come and share a piece of his music and the people then at their tables of six to talk about what they heard in his music and then he gave a, a reflection he preached if you will about why he wrote that piece of music and that 17 year old preacher was our very own producer ian wow, wow. Oh, amazing. Good, good, <laughs> there's good, ian good, good. and he did really well great well you yeah. know what um speaking of ian Yes. I'm going to get a copy of that sermon, by the way, because I'd love to hear it. But um, <laughs> one of the great things we do here, Peter, every week, and we've started this um, for a while now, is a little segment for Ian. We ask our listeners to either uh, email or, or send notes in, yep. um, and, and the segment is known as Ask Ian Anything. Ask Ian okay. Anything. So okay. apparently this week we got a, we got we a have question, a, a, and, and so we have Kevin's question. got it. You're Last on our hot way. seat here. You're Ian. on the hot seat. He, he's, Can he not, handle it? he's not familiar with the question. Are you ready? Yeah, last week was... Uh, a little rough. Let's go. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> well, last week we were off. Right. Well, the last podcast, okay. my answer was a little Fair rough. Fair enough. So but we go. had brought a guy all the way in from Wheatley for that question. That's so, right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. So uh, theoretically, he was from Wheatley. He uh -huh. might have been from down the street. but <laughs> Might have been. Okay. So listener asked me to ask Ian mm -hmm. because uh, the listener knows that the theme music leading into this podcast you wrote and performed yourself yes. is aware that you perform music in, in, in other venues. Where do you get your inspiration for your music? Okay. Okay. Wow. Deep. Huh. The wheels are spinning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, wow. I can smell smoke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get my inspiration from my life, which is a really boring answer. Wow, well, um, I believe that. Not but, necessarily. But, like, I, I feel a lot of feelings, um, and... I, I, I like to write those feelings down rather than, um, you know, like text someone about them or whatever. Like I have a notebook at home that I write things in and um, I get inspired from stories that I've heard, um, like personal experiences. Um, I don't know, just sometimes inspiration can like hit you over the head with a brick. Sure. Um, and then other times it's like molasses. So yeah. it's really, I don't know, a give and take I guess sure. there's I think my it's answer. It's pretty cool that you have a notebook because I'll tell you who yeah. had a notebook who carried a notebook with him all the time was Leonard Cohen. Mm. And uh, his son, uh, Adam, uh, just recently released a new book where a lot of Leonard Cohen's notes in it. I think they said it was some outrageous number, like 800 notebooks they collected wow. of his after his death. And he always had a little notebook. And, he'd, and sometimes he'd begin a song in one decade yeah. and finish it in the next. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Ian, no, keep it up. You're man. following in good steps. That's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say yeah. so. Yeah, the best music, the best lyrics, the best songs yeah. that really transform people come from experience mm -hmm. that's related back through song, and that's a gift. And uh, yeah, keep at it. it you know, uh, and he's going to go learning about it. I think, Rob. Well, that's the other thing because the other question that we've been kind of waiting with bated breath on. Was I mean, he, the listeners was are dying to, to know. Ian was waiting to find out if he got accepted into the program that he was trying to get into. So what's the verdict, Ian? Should be a drum roll there. That'd be really good. <laughs> well, you're the producer. You're the you producer, might be able yeah. to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have been accepted into music industry arts. Ah, ah, <laughs> well done. Banshaw Congratulations. Very good. Banshaw. Banshaw. Let's go. be in the downtown College. campus. Yeah. Very good. I'm very excited. Yeah. As you should be. Yeah, That's a great school and a great program. You. It is. Yeah. Were you always program. interested in music? I always, like, I have been always interested in music, um, but I think the songwriting and producing side of me has come out recently in the last sort of two years-ish. Yeah. yeah, there's there's that answer. Yeah, we certainly have an opportunity to do more of that. So Yeah, yeah next year. And yeah. with people that are in the same that's right. kind of space with you, right? That's yeah. what's kind of nice about Pretty it. Cool. You surround yourself with other artists with and you'll meet Mo. backgrounds. And yeah, you'll meet, you'll Mo. meet Mo from uh, Who's Pursuit Mo? of Happiness. Mo. Pursuit of Happiness, yeah. man. 
Yeah. Okay. You'll find She's out. a girl with a problem. That's right. And there ain't no cure. <laughs> no, that's not Mole. That's Mole from the Simpsons. That's the Northern that's Pikes. Mole. That's yeah. the Northern that's Pikes. Very different. Uh, <laughs> I'm an adult now. How about I'm an adult that? Now. I got that's it right what now. it is. Mo, yeah. What it is. Mo yeah. Berg, is that his name? Mo Berg from yeah. Pursuit of Happiness. Yeah. Anyway, it's at uh, uh, VickersCrossing at gmail.com. Tweet us at Vickers Crossing. Get your questions in to ask Ian anything. Good. Okay. All right, well, let's get to Peter here. He hasn't yeah. walked out on us yet, so uh, Frank, yes. what do you that. guys got in store here? Frank Escados right. is waiting. <laughs> He's waiting. <laughs> so, no, it's good to have you here. We want to touch on a few things. Um, we talk a lot about when we have guests in, that yeah. we want to share a little bit about their story and where they're sure. from. So we want to get into that a little bit. But yeah. right off the top, I want to ask a question about something that the whole country's talking about right, right. now. Especially and today. It, it is kind of the elephant in the room, and we want, to, we want to bring it up, especially today. So we're recording this on a day... Um, that uh, the Prime Minister held a press conference earlier on this morning to talk a little bit more about the uh, SNC-Lavalin um, story that's coming out mm -hmm. of, of Ottawa. So um, he held a press conference earlier this morning. Um, yesterday, uh, Gerald Butts, the senior advisor to Trudeau, spoke before the Commons Committee. And um, basically, from what is coming out on all this, there's two stories being told here. One, of course, from Jody Wilson-Raybould, the former Minister of Justice and AG, about what happened uh, in her experience, and then uh, Gerald Butts and the Prime Minister refuting that a little bit on the other side of things. So this has kind of been going on back and forth. And uh, so we just kind of wanted to ask you, Peter, what's, what's your take on this? Um, can you respond to the crisis at all? What do you want to share with with maybe your constituents listening about what's going on with sure. this. Sure. No, I'm always happy to uh, to have conversations, even on difficult subjects. I've given several uh, several interviews on this in the past, uh, I guess, a month since the story broke. Shocking. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> with, probably with some real journalists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? <laughs> hey. Instead of us. <laughs> well, assuming these two vicars, <laughs> no. and they want to know about SNC and Lavalin. It, it, it sounds good to me that you want to sit down and talk about anything. I'm an open book here. Uh, the first thing I'll say is... I, I don't know that crisis is the the right word to apply here, not to mm -hmm. diminish at all the importance of of the issue. Important questions are being asked about it, and, and you too uh, and, and other folks are very welcome to, uh, to ask questions, and I think you should ask questions. Uh, for me, here's the, the most important thing that we know at this point, that nothing illegal has transpired in this situation, even by the admission of Miss Wilson-Raybould, who I have high regard for. Uh, she herself to the Commons Committee when she testified, I guess it was on the 27th of February, mm -hmm. uh, was asked, do you believe that anything illegal happened here? And she said no. So she was unequivocal in that. And that's the line for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot accept anything that is illegal. None of us could in a, in a democracy. And so what are we left with from there? Uh, in my mind, we are left with the fact that there was obviously a disagreement on how to handle the SNC-Lavalin challenge, the, the, the situation facing the company, whether to pursue formal criminal proceedings for violations of a Canadian law, or whether to offer what's called, a, now we're going to get a bit technical, but uh, a DPA or a deferred uh, prosecution agreement to the company. Um, that would allow the company to not be banned from uh, pursuing federal contracts for 10 years, because if that happened, and that would only happen if they were found guilty in court, then there is a very high likelihood that they uh, would, uh, it would devastate the company and they would uh, be forced to lay off in the neighborhood of 9,000 people right across the country, not mm -hmm. only in Quebec because the company has a presence throughout Canada. Right. And so that's why the deferred prosecution agreement uh, is something that I, I think the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office uh, was uh, very interested in, in looking at. And frankly, from my perspective, I think they were quite right to, uh, to look at it. Mm -hmm. We learned yesterday in the testimony of Mr. Butts that what the, uh, the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office was seeking was simply a second opinion from Ms. Wilson-Raybould. Uh, and there was, as I say, a disagreement on, on how best to, uh, to pursue things. From there, we're left with, uh, we, we can only speculate, mm -hmm. because we're left with uh, differing interpretations as to what happened from the various people involved. And we all know that when situations arise where there's a disagreement, the various people involved, not just in this case, but I'm sure. talking in life in general, yeah. there can be different takeaways. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that are engaged in the, uh, in the discussion and the disagreement and the argument 
can walk away thinking that different things have, have taken place. Uh, it's my understanding, as Mr. Butts put it yesterday, that the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister didn't know that Ms. Wilson-Raybould had in mid-September made up her mind firmly on this issue that was not communicated in writing and that she had initiated meetings to, to sit down and, and talk about many other issues and SNC would come up, right. but not in a way where, uh, at least from Mr. Butts' perspective, and we, I don't want to speak for him, but you heard the testimony yeah. yesterday, he did not feel that there was pressure being applied. Ms. Wilson-Raybould obviously felt differently. So that's what we're, we're, we're left to kind of uh, uh, sift through the various accounts that have been offered here and, and also the testimony of the clerk of the Privy Council, yeah. uh, Michael Warnick's account, uh, I think is, is important as well. Uh, that's someone who's served conservative and uh, liberal mm -hmm. governments, right. uh, someone who's respected in the public service. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you have credible people, honorable people trying to do their job, trying to do their work as best as they can. And from there, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, at this point in time, cast judgment on what exactly happened. The key point, I, I end here with the point that I made at the outset, nothing illegal took place. Sure. And I think the Prime Minister had the best interests of the country, and in particular the Canadian economy in mind, mm -hmm. because when we're talking about 9,000 jobs, we're ultimately talking about 9,000 families. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget all those jobs in the supply chain, many more than 9,000 and all the pensioners that would be affected if SNC-Lavalin was forced to, uh, to shut down because they couldn't bid on, on federal contracts for, right. for a decade. So that's, the, that's how I see things. So two things. Yeah. Uh, one of them uh, is, uh, I, I was glad to hear you speak about the deferred uh, prosecution agreement. Um, I, part of what's frustrating for me is to hear uh, Mr. Shear talking about, um, uh, you know, calling for a resignation because... Uh, once again, it's evident that the Prime Minister wanted to let these people walk free, mm -hmm. which is not the case. Yeah. A deferred, uh, as I understand it, the, the, the deferred uh, prosecution agreement is not exactly uh, a, a slap on the wrist. No, it, it certainly is not. It's an alternative legal mechanism, if, right. you, if you like, one that is in place in the United States, in the United Kingdom. Yeah. France has a variation of it, and Australia is, is putting that into its law. Uh, it was the Harper government, actually, that initiated the movement towards putting in place a deferred prosecution agreement. They lost the election of 2015, mm -hmm. and so it was left to our government to pursue it with a view to not helping any one company, right. per se, uh, but with a wider view of harmonizing our legal system so mm -hmm. that from a competitiveness perspective, yes. it matched with what existed in other countries. Uh, C uh, Canadian businesses were saying, well, look, in very special, and the Canadian public as well, not just uh, Canadian businesses were saying, in very special circumstances, very unique circumstances, you could have a company mm -hmm. that employs thousands of people yeah. that has at some point in time broken the law, and if they're found guilty, the entire company could in effect fold. Why would we punish innocent people for the, for the crimes of a few? Mm -hmm. And so that's where deferred prosecution agreements come in that allow for a massive penalty to be paid mm -hmm. by the company and, of course, uh, the individuals who were responsible for violations in law to, be, to face justice. Held accountable, yeah. Exactly. But why would we want to punish uh, workers right. and their families and pensioners and those in the supply chain when they haven't done anything sure. wrong. Yeah. And that's why deferred prosecution agreements are a perfectly legitimate, as I say, uh, legal option right. or mechanism, if you like, to, uh, to have in place in, in a democracy like Canada. So the second thing that came to mind then is about your caucus. Yes. Um, obviously, uh, in the fallout of all this, Jane Philpott resigned. Yes, that unfortunately. That sort of shook yeah. people to the core a little yeah. bit, probably. Yeah. Uh, you're in caucus. And does the prime minister enjoy the confidence of caucus? Uh, he certainly does. Yeah. And he... Let me be absolutely clear about this. He enjoys my confidence. Yeah. I have full faith in this prime minister. Yeah. Uh, again, in this situation, nothing illegal transpired, so he has my confidence for that. But I would say as important are the achievements of the government. Yeah. We have seen real massive reforms put in place in this country 
I think of the Canada Child Benefit mm -hmm. that has, it, in my lifted own... Lifted people out of poverty. Lifted people of, out of poverty right across the country. Uh, around 300,000 people have been lifted, out of, and children yes, in children particular, yeah. lifted out of poverty because of the Canada Child Benefit. 17,000 kids alone in the community that I represent, London North Centre, receive yeah. the Canada Child Benefit. It's been a very important change because before we had a, a child benefit system in place but it was not means tested in other words right. it went to everyone yeah. uh, so you could the the i have nothing against millionaires but uh, i don't think it's it, uh, i don't think it's just for someone who's making 10 million dollars i sort of get a little excited about millionaires <laughs> <laughs> that's fine but if if, if someone uh, is making let's say 10 million dollars a year and, they probably and happens don't need to have 1300 kids, bucks a month they yeah. probably don't need the support of a of a child benefit that yeah. that money should be going to families earning a a middle income or a lower income and, yeah. and and it is 900,000 jobs created across the country since 2015 uh, the renegotiation of NAFTA, which is very important for London and southwestern Ontario, considering the nature of our economy. And keep in mind who were, we were negotiating with. Yes, uh, yeah. The most uh, protectionist American government we've seen since the oh, 1930s. Yeah. And the most unpredictable American president yes. and indeed world leader that, uh, yeah. that we've seen really in the modern era, I think yeah. it's fair to say. And we came out of that uh, in, in, uh, quite secure uh, from an economic perspective. That approach, all of those things, and there's many more things that I could point to, but um, all of that is the result of the prime minister's work and the government's work. Yeah. Uh, so I think London is in a much better position. We have a low, much lower unemployment rate than what existed in 2015. In fact, we have the lowest unemployment rate right now that we have uh, have had since 2004. Yeah. And so I, I'm glad to go on with yeah, achievement yeah. after achievement, yeah. but I'm not going to take up all the oxygen hey, you here. You sound like you're boasting. It, well, <laughs> I'm boasting for the prime minister because I think he, he's done a, a very good job. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm quite uh, quite happy to continue to to serve with confidence as a member of the uh, the Liberal Party and Liberal government. Well, thank you for that. I mean, no, I think that's yeah. what we need sure. to hear, right? And I think yeah. the listeners, are certainly in your constituency, but others across the country, need to hear from somebody who's right. in government how to feel about that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so then, just as a final thing, sure. are there some next steps coming up to this? I mean, once. Uh, uh, testimony's been given and the committees have met and such. What can Canadians expect over the next little while on this, or, or is this, this kind of just stop? Well, the matter is is being looked at. It, it's yeah. not as if the government has said that uh, we're we don't want to know what what has happened. No, the Justice Committee is is looking at the issue. Uh, they did call, as you saw, uh, Miss Wilson Raybould to testify, and yesterday, Gerald Butts, excuse me, obviously testified, and and they'll continue doing that work. Okay. And so for me, it's, it's a simply a matter of following that. And also, it's important to note that the Ethics Commissioner is, is going to look into whether or not there were ethical questions that came up. Yeah. This whole issue of what is appropriate pressure and what is inappropriate pressure, that is a very gray area. It is not clear at all. It's yeah. not defined in law, for example, mm -hmm. what constitutes appropriate or inappropriate pressure. Uh, I know that uh, you mentioned next steps. We saw a next step taken today yes. uh, when the Prime Minister made a statement saying that there was a clear, uh, uh, a broken sense of trust between mm -hmm. him and the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General. From there, uh, we'll have to learn from this situation and put in place particular reforms. And I think the Prime Minister alluded to this. We will look at the potential of dividing the Minister of Justice portfolio, uh, which is I'm a political a role, of, and that. the Attorney General uh, yeah. role, which is nonpartisan. Mm. Uh, Britain has a, a system in place where the two roles are in fact divided, and I think that ought to be looked at. We'll, we'll see what else the, the government pursues in terms of next steps. Uh, we do need to learn from this and, and, and make a few changes. Uh, and so I, I look forward to that. And I would simply ask your listeners to, to keep an open mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, we. Um, in, in this society, it is quite easy, I think, to rush to judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think we can do that here. I think we have to allow people to share their perspective as to what happened. And I think that that is happening and that will continue to happen with respect to the SNC-Lavalin issue that right. you've brought and up. And at the end of the day, my hope is always that we can do better and get better That's and right. learn yep. and move forward on it. It's That's heartening it's to hear somebody say, as he did this morning, you know, I'm learning that it, that the trust right. was broken. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, you know, hopefully, there's a place in caucus still for Miss uh, Wilson Raybould and uh, um, 
I'm having one of those. Miss Philpot. Philpot. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I hold Miss Philpot in in very high esteem, uh, and I was disappointed to she to see that she had resigned from the cabinet. Uh, she is someone that um, that's highly intelligent, a wonderful person, and so we will see what happens uh, on their. The other, I don't want to leave it aside because um, in raising it, it raises a natural question that your listeners might have, which is what is their, their future right. in the caucus? And that is up to, to them to decide That's difficult and too. the There's prime minister to decide and, and we'll, yeah. uh, we'll see what exactly happens. But sure. um, uh, governments have difficult moments and, and this is obviously a difficult moment. For me, I'm focused on my constituents, on, on serving them, on representing them. I obviously wasn't involved in, in the discussions that happened around what to do with SNC Lavalin? Okay. So yeah. I'm I'm focused on doing my job as a yeah. member of Parliament. Right. Well, that's good. Let's find out maybe a little bit more about sure. what yeah. brought you here. <laughs> well, Peter, yeah. Lent, Lent is a good time for reconciliation, that's right? right? Maybe yeah. they're going to fix all yeah. this stuff up. <laughs> you know, everybody's going to sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya or something like that. But, but, well. but nonetheless, uh, well, originally, before yeah. all this stuff sort of cropped up and we right. were trying to get you here, yeah. uh, we, we really wanted to engage the conversation that we've been having here at... Uh, at crossings yeah. every time we come here, which is about faith in the public square and where they intersect. Right. And so um, I thought it would be nice. Uh, not everybody knows uh, your background and where you come from uh -huh. um, in terms of, of your, your family's background, but we know you, your family's of Greek descent. Your grandmother immigrated from Greece following World War II, and uh, she was later uh -huh. um, an organizer for the New Democratic Party's leader, yes. uh, Tommy Douglas and Stephen mm. Lewis. How did I become a liberal then? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, no, I could see how that might happen. But you, you have said in the past that your interest in politics and social justice yes. are attributable to your grandmother. Yes, in and, many ways. Uh, I'm wondering if you can share more about her, about perhaps her, her faith, your own faith, and how faith has played a role in, in her witness and subsequently your witness in your own life. Because I know social justice has been a thing for you before you ran for office. Sure. And that's no. been big for us in terms of how we operate here in this forum. No, I'm very happy to do that. Unfortunately, we lost our grandmother um, on the 27th of December, so uh, oh, we I'm still no. That's uh, it's fine. Uh, in fact, I love talking about her, so I'm glad you yeah. you raise it. Um, yes, I have Greek descent, and I'm I'm very proud of my Greek heritage. My father came here in 1971, and for years he had the the Malibu restaurant on Dundas oh, okay. that you might uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that, yeah, that you might that. know. I'm a big. I, I've been to the other Malibus where right. my, where my haunts when the one closed at uh, Wonderland in Oxford yeah, okay. and I just went to the new one that's open. Right? The new one yes uh, so it's uh, it's still in the family uh, it, the one that you're talking about at Oxford and Wonderland it was sold yeah. it was sold to uh, to the Wimpy's franchise so it's now a yes, Wimpy's, a Wimpy's right. Right. but yeah. Uh, yeah it's in my uncle's hands now and they've opened a, a new location right around Southdale and, and Wonderland. This okay. is not a plug this is well, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> well I will to, gladly uh, plug the Malibu so because up, I love the Malibu. You'll have to go get advertising dollars for them or something uh, like Panzerati that. Panzerati is fantastic. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And if you take a look at me you'll know yeah. you can go by never trust a skinny <laughs> chef and I'm telling you the food is good. The food is very good. That's yeah. what brought my uh, my father to London. He he started off in Montreal and then went to Cornwall uh, bought a pizza place there with his brother in I guess it was 1972 or 3 and they turned around the business. They bought it around uh, they bought it for $13,000 sold it a year or two later for Seventy-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. This is the mid '70s, so oh, okay. uh, they could then take that and come to London. They they went around southern Ontario, uh, trying to find somewhere to buy a, a new business, mm -hmm. and they ended up in London. They saw the Malibu, and really liked it, and put an offer, and and then it was theirs uh, for wow. many years. Yeah, uh, so that's that's why I'm here. In fact, my father met my my mother at the Malibu. Oh, really? And okay. so that's my yeah. that's my story on. From that, uh, from that end of the family, but with respect to my grandmother, yeah, she came to Canada in 1955. She had a very hard life in the early part of her mm -hmm. years, at, le uh, at least. She was born into poverty. She saw a Nazi occupation. She witnessed the Greek Civil War mm -hmm. that followed wow. the, uh, World War II. And so when she settled here, she, had, she came quite traumatized, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, uh, along with uh, other relatives and other folks from her uh, village, which is in and around the area of Corinth, Greece, if you uh, oh, yeah. famous for this, uh, yeah. Isthmus. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So she came to Montreal, eventually came to London, worked at the Lacmac sewing factory. Mm. 
and uh, yeah, earned uh, a living as a seamstress. Was always very interested in uh, causes around labor and human rights. So she was a, a union activist, for example. Uh, worked hard to try to uh, to gain uh, labor rights at the workplace, unionize, and, and things like that. And I, I suppose uh, those values have very much been instilled in me. My father has a, a small C conservative side to him because he's a small business, business owner. Man, yeah, right. uh, uh, and so I, I have that fiscal, that, that uh, value and ethic of fiscal responsibility has been instilled in me because of him. But uh, my uh, my attention to social justice comes to me from my mother, but especially from my my grandmother, uh, who lived with us, and that's why she had a, uh. such a tremendous impact on on my life. She helped to raise my brother and sister and I, and I, I remember her always telling us to to focus on uh, the the downtrodden, uh, the the oppressed, the the marginalized. It, that it wasn't always about going out to uh, to earn. Uh, uh, a massive income. I remember uh, at one point in my high school years and, and early university, I wanted to be a corporate lawyer because I thought that would be a good way to make a lot of money, which <laughs> yeah. turns out it is. It is. Corporate actually, yeah. lawyers yeah. do pretty it well. It turns out to be very true. Yeah. But I, I remember telling You're her making this. making out well in Ottawa right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I remember talking to her about what I wanted to do in, in early university, and she said, well, you're, you're fine to pursue your own path. She said, but don't forget that uh, life is much more about money. It's about uh, finding something that you're passionate about and, and helping people. She said, if you're not helping people, then you're not doing much of anything. Uh, and so that's always mm -hmm. stayed with me. That attention to social justice comes from her, no question. Mm -hmm. Was she a woman of faith? Yes, very much so. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Christian, and uh, we are members of the Greek Orthodox Church here in, in London. Mm -hmm. You will know their church on, on Southdale Road. Yeah. And, right. uh, we were raised in, in the church uh, as, as young people. In fact, at, uh, at her funeral, when I was uh, speaking about her to, her, to, to the family and to, to friends, I, I brought up a few stories. And one of the stories that I recounted was uh, when I was, along with my brother and sister and I, we were, especially me, we were not the most well-behaved of kids. And so <laughs> she had to find ways in church to make sure that we right. were well-behaved. Right. Yeah. And she would tell us, well, look, if you're, you're quiet for the next hour or two, and in fact, in the Greek Orthodox Church, well, you could might know, three. Kevin, yeah. three or four hours. Uh, she said, if Two, you, you'd be getting off easy. Yeah, two is, is getting off very easy. So if you're quiet for the next three or four hours, then we'll go to Tim Hortons and we'll have some donuts afterwards, right. or we'll go home and, uh, you know, I'll make you something. She was a fantastic cook, uh, yeah, 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 and yeah. especially good with desserts. So that worked. That had its, uh, <laughs> it had its charm uh, for us. So, uh, yes, a woman of faith, and I think her, her sense of faith instilled in her uh, a, an ethic of social justice that she passed down to us. Well, and I think that that's what you see, right, is that, that intersection again of faith right. and public service. Yeah, exactly. No, and, and speak, you know, talking just a little bit about your grandmother's story, it would have been uh, easy and understandable if she came through all that difficulty, um, hopeless or angry or, but Better, you're, yeah, yeah you, you said it was the other thing. It was about helping others and making sure others were taken care of. That's right. She always had a very positive outlook in life. Uh, I mentioned before the various challenges that she experienced, especially in the early years. Uh, but she never let that weigh her down. Right. She never let that, um, she was not a negative person at all. She was always hopeful, always positive. And uh, I think there, I think much of that uh, came from her faith. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a great sense of hope that's offered in uh, the teachings of Christianity. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it certainly had an impact on her and in turn myself and my brother and sister. Yeah. Well, so despite the fact that you were running around causing all this, all this trouble, and waiting for a donut still turned out to be a good right, boy. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, but did, did that time um, growing up in, in your faith community um, um, kind of help you make the decision to, to go into politics? And did you see perhaps some things in growing up in that community, in a faith community that kind of uh, played over into, into what you were doing now? Yes, I would say so. Um, certainly being raised in um, in a family where uh, faith was uh, taken very seriously mm. uh, one cannot help but be exposed to moral questions and moral challenges mm -hmm. i remember uh, when i was uh, long before politics so i was in university thinking about what i wanted to do when i made the decision not to go into law i made the decision <laughs> uh, to go into academia 
and uh, I ended up uh, finishing school and ended up back here and we were just talking before the recording started about mm -hmm. uh, yeah I, I taught at Huron College and taught political science there to begin with and then shifted over to King's College and did some work on the main campus and then I thought I would spend my career at the university teaching both church universities by the yeah. way Exa yeah. yes yeah. yes ex <laughs> so. exactly yeah. uh, and I was quite happy I, I thought I'd teach uh, international relations and Canadian public policy as I was doing and I was writing in the media as well but I saw certain challenges that existed here in the community. As you know, 2008 was very difficult yeah. for all democracies, but in cities such as London that are very, uh, very much tied to an industrial uh, uh, economic yeah. uh, system, economic base, I should say, in our economy, it was a very difficult uh, time, and uh, the results really have uh, impacted our community in a negative way. I saw an opportunity to to volunteer as a result. So I was, uh, I remember going into the London Food Bank to, to help out and, and volunteer and, and volunteer with other causes around poverty and uh, the environment and issues of, of social justice, broadly speaking. Sure. From there, I was motivated to, to turn to politics because I thought that I could offer something and, and that politics was a way to, not the only way, but a way to, to bring change to a city that I care very much about because it accepted my family. Yeah. yeah. Right. So just connecting those things up, actually, uh, just a few days ago in a meeting with leaders from Latin America, Pope Francis spoke about faith and politics, mm -hmm. actually, particularly to young people there and what a lot of them are going through in terms of having to fight back against, in some cases, very unfair and um, undemocratic systems. Um, he said, I invite you, speaking to the youth, uh, to live your faith with great freedom, never believing that there exists only one form of political commitment for mm -hmm. Catholics, a Catholic party. Quoting Pope Paul the VI, Francis continued, in concrete situations and taking account of solidarity in each person's life, one must recognize a legitimate variety of possible options. The same Christian faith can lead to different commitments. For that reason, Francis said, Catholic politicians will join different parties and will work with people of other faiths in mm -hmm. pursuing the common good. With all of that in mind, I just right. wonder if you could respond to that because I think sometimes, you know, and, and sometimes where the church gets, we get pulled in or out of politics and what's going on, but how do, you're a person of faith, as you say, you've been influenced greatly by mm -hmm. people of faith, uh, and you have to work towards that common good. How do you live in those tensions, and where do those things intersect well? How do you respond to what the Pope has shared just this week in light of these conversations? I think it's a fantastic question, and one that... Frankly, I don't often get asked, and so I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, to dwell on this because it is it's so. First of all, I have such great respect for for Pope Francis and what he has tried to do as the leader of the Catholic Church. Yes, I am Greek Orthodox, yeah. but I'm I'm a Christian uh, yeah. first and foremost, and so I respect him, especially his focus on on social justice uh, and and uplifting the poor has been mm -hmm. deeply, deeply moving. We need more leaders like him. I'll say this. I'm secular in my politics, mm -hmm. but I'm a Christian in my personal life. And so I'm reminded of what's said in the Synoptic gospel, Gospels, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, mm -hmm. and render unto God what is God's. I might have the quote. Uh, mm -hmm. It might not be verbatim. Mm -hmm. in other w and I was always moved by that because I think it gives a justification for secular approaches to government. Mm -hmm in a way that allows us to, as a multi-faith and multicultural society, to, to move forward and, and, and have a sense of unity. Uh, I'm a Christian, but I stand up at a moment's notice when, uh, the, uh, when a Muslim needs help sure. in my office, when a Jew needs help right. in my office with whatever issue might exist. And I think we need to really embrace that approach to uh, to government and to politics. Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, we see theocracies in the world and we see how, um, how difficult it is for citizens living in, in countries that are theocratically based. We have a multi-faith and multi-ethnic society. And so a secular approach to government allows us to all exist under the umbrella of a government that governs for all of us. Mm -hmm. And we are protected by the Charter of Rights and, and freedoms. That is a, a secular document that ensures religious freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I come 
at these issues from from that perspective that uh, that secularity is is uh, a, a underpinning principle of our democracy, but that people of faith, including politicians who Im, who are uh, Christian or uh, Muslim or Jew or whatever f- the faith might uh, might be, that they can also exist within that secular system, uh, raise issues that are important to them, and do so in in common cause with their their fellow citizen. Okay. So one of the does that answer your question? In, or in part, it, yeah, yeah. in in, in a, a little bit, and it's a little bit of a, a, a good political answer because you're a good politician. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, no, no. So I don't want to be too. I, no, I'm not no. trying to be political. I know you're yeah, not. Yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. But but I, I'll, I'll tell you the sort of thing that comes to mind. Yeah. All right. Because sure. really, what strikes my mind is what happens when something that's happening in your in in the political world collides with your own sets of values okay. and beliefs. Right. So Joe Colmartin was a close friend of mine. Okay, Joe yes. was a member of parliament, as you know, for a number of years. Yes, he so Joe, highly respected. Yes, but right across the political parties. Yeah. So so Joe um, voted, stood and voted uh, in favor of uh, same-gender uh, marriage mm-hmm. and was sanctioned by his church at the time, Roman Catholic Church, quite publicly across the Diocese of London. Letters were, were read in pulpits to mm-hmm. say that he was, he was being... Uh, removed from any marriage prep and so on and so on. There were other ramifications for that. And so, but Joe felt on principle that even though his faith called him to, as mm-hmm. said, his church said one thing, he felt called to something else. Yes. It's that sort of a thing, I guess, that sort of. Yeah. Uh, so. What happens yeah. when, when, when the party line is different? Than no, your pers- no, pr- it's, it's a very good question. And one I've been asked many times. I, I go back to what I said before about the importance of secularism yep. in a multi-faith, multi-ethnic society. I don't think that I, as someone who in my personal life happened to be Christian, can impose my values mm-hmm. on someone who is uh, Islamic, uh, a Muslim, or yeah. a Jewish, or, or an atheist for that matter. Uh, we all belong to this society, and so because it's so diverse, secularism is our only option. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to approaching uh, public uh, qu- public policy questions where there is a moral difficulty, mm-hmm. I, I think back to what I said before, render unto, unto God what is God's, and uh, sorry, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, yeah. and, and render unto yeah. God what is God's. Uh, in other words, and I'll be very, I'll give you a specific example as to how I've dealt with uh, a lot of these issues. Uh, I look at issues of morality. Certainly I'm informed by my faith on a number of questions. But I also think that because the society is so diverse that we have an obligation to look at what the charter says on a number of, a number of uh, points. Uh, and that's what I've been uh, able to do. Uh, and, and so uh, take a, a abortion, for, for yeah. example. I, have to, I happen to be pro-choice. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there will be Christians who say that that issue is... is uh, uh, that one cannot be a Christian and be pro-choice. I happen to some to Christians disagree. will say that. Yeah. Uh, some yeah. some will, yeah. and I happen to disagree with that. But yeah. not only is that a personal disagreement, I point to, for example, the uh, the argument in in the charter that talks about security of the person, mm-hmm. that talks about the um, the need to uh, ensure that we're all protected, that our rights and freedoms are all protected under a, a system of law that is secular where you can disagree yeah. but uh, move forward in a way where we're uh, taking into account the rights of everyone yeah. mm-hmm. well thank god we're not going to impose what we think on everybody that's else. right <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> think you can trouble. Yeah. Yeah. but at the end of the day it's like the quote you read from pope francis is you're working with other faiths to find the common, common good. good and you know hey we all know ask 10 Christians a question about well, you get 10, you get d- yeah. ten different answers yeah. but at the end of the day if the common good is to take care of the need of that person mm-hmm. and to put yourself second so that they can be lifted up right then that's right that's the whole crux of it and the, and the best and, we've seen of us in this community and others is when we've all banded together right exactly you know? and we put all the other stuff aside so, and yeah, say let's right. take care of that need over there yeah. and we'll argue about yeah. what's morally right and wrong and what's you know uh, I find we'll that do that later but uh, I get impressed by, you know, you said about your own stance uh, in terms of pro-life. Uh, Joe took a stance uh, in terms of same-sex unions that was contrary to his church, but sure. but core to his values. <laughs> and uh, he, you know, he paid a personal price for it. 
but that's what comes with and I, yeah. I, I believe there's a lot of integrity in that uh, uh, we it's difficult because of course you want to allow people elected politicians I'm thinking of in particular they will have personal beliefs that, that matter a great deal to them uh, but uh, we have a society that's so diverse and we need to have a system of government that protects all of us yes. Uh, you can be personal in your, uh, sorry, you can be religious in your personal life, but when it comes to putting in place law, that law has to work for everyone yeah. uh, as much as possible. And so uh, the alternative would be to have a system where we're imposing yeah. our, our own religious beliefs onto a society that is very diverse. Yeah. That not, is, not right that's go. not, uh, that's not appropriate. Let me go back to what you had said earlier that when you wanted to think about going into politics, it was about how can I offer myself to, to do something for that's my right. community. Yep. And at the end of the day, um, we are Christians or Muslims or Jewish because we're offering ourselves to yeah. something greater than ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, we can't lose sight of that. That's not wrong. Yeah. And if we if you consider those stories that, you know, you, your grandmother would have told the stories that she would have heard uh, in Four Hour Church, uh, <laughs> that you would have heard in Four Hour Church. Uh, the, the gospel is a very social gospel. Mm -hmm. And on the whole, it's a call uh, for exactly what you're talking about, which is a reach towards a, a more common good, a greater understanding of how we can bring people together. That's right. And so, you know, when we're able to take how we're formed and use that going forward, uh, in terms of how we serve in the public square, I think that's a, a, a tremendous right. gift. If, if you lend yourself, it, it, I just, I'm very heartened by the notion that somebody like your grandmother comes to this country, instills in you what she's instilled in you, and that you're taking that and bringing it uh, right. to your life today. I, I find those things very helpful. No, it is, and we're all the product of our experiences. Uh, I was very fortunate to be raised by one who, uh, by a person who is, uh, was rather, um, still hard to think of her uh, yeah, as, as, uh, as not with us. Mm -hmm. uh, very vested in um, the, the society, always caring about other people. Uh, and so I, I won't forget that example. Certainly. Good, good. Well, our, our time's coming to an end. Okay. We've been able to touch on a lot of different things, and we're thrilled about that. Um, and we're glad we, uh, we finally got you in here to, to spend a little time with us, Peter. So I was thank thrilled you so to much. do it. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. We have, we have one order of business we have to do, yes, and that we do. is to offer him. But beyond that, we have to offer him uh, congratulations. He has a wedding coming up. Right. Yes. Yes. I, I do. heard that. Thank you very married. much. Yeah. Yes, you that's right. Engaged now, and there's a wedding coming. There is a wedding coming in June, and uh, we're, we're very excited. Will Good. it be four hours? Good. or? Will be well, before hour hours, yeah. <laughs> knowing how my church will gets sometimes be, uh, I would say probably. Uh, will no, there be I, it's quite. It's wedding. quite. Uh, uh, weddings are quite shorter <laughs> in the uh, <laughs> in the Greek Orthodox Church than, yeah, than okay. a regular Sunday service. All but right. uh, no, get we're we're very much looking forward to it. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank Enjoy. you very much. Enjoy. It's good to have you here. All right, uh, that uh, wraps things up for another edition of the Vickers Crossing here from Crossings Pub and Eatery. How can people find us, Kevin? Although they've well, already found us because they're listening, well, but we got to tell them anyway. You know, you go look for us at Vickers Crossing on uh, any of your favorite apps for listening to uh, to uh, podcasts, or you can email us. Don't forget for asking anything at vickerscrossing at gmail dot com, and uh, you can uh, tweet us at Vickers Crossing, and you of course find us on Facebook at the Vickers Crossing. So okay, very have good. Have a look. Thanks again to Peter, um, to producer Ian for coming in and uh, and not only doing all of our technical work, but answering all those man. tough questions. He's an inspired man. That's right. And all congratulations. Yeah, congratulations you. on your acceptance you. into Fanshawe. Yeah. Good. I can't wait to see you at the Junos when they come back in <laughs> another right. 10 years. Yeah, Ian's right. going <laughs> to be, be, be on stage well, performing. We're looking yeah, he'll be the host. To, he'll be the fully clothed lady. All right. <laughs> As opposed to the bare naked lady. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks. That's good. It's time to wrap it up. <laughs> For uh, Kevin George from St. Aidan's, my name is Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's. Thanks for being here until we get together again next time. Don't forget to look both ways. Before you cross the street. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Catherine Olenek. If you have any questions or want to know how to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks! <laughs>